thank you all for joining us uh, today for our uh, October regular call for the Public Safety Internet of Things Working Group. Uh, and so today um, we will get right into the uh, presentation. Uh, we are going through uh, over the next few meetings uh, some um, review and presentations on uh, discipline-specific uh, topics related to the Internet of Things. And today we will be talking about, uh, uh, well, a lot of things, but primarily the fire service. And we have uh, uh, a great uh, presenter today. His name is Ray Lear, Chief Ray Lear. And Ray, is uh, he's worked in public safety for his entire career, 30 years with Baltimore City Fire Department. He retired in 2000 as Assistant Chief. He spent the next two, 10 years as a subject matter expert in public safety communications and interoperability for large system integrators. He has served as Maryland Statewide Interoperability Director 2009 to 2014, and he is also the, has served as Maryland State Point of Contact, is the SPOC for FirstNet, and uh, worked to start up the, uh, the initial state consultation process in Maryland. Um, he's also uh, participated as a subject matter expert in two APCO-sponsored hackathons, and he's done a whole lot of other things, more than I can even mention here. And so I am going to turn the, uh, the presentation right over to Ray, and he is going to talk about smart buildings plus smart devices equals smarter first responders. So, Ray, the floor is yours. Thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, Barry, for that introduction. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me here. Uh, it's great to have a chance to discuss the future of firefighting with this group today. Uh, I've actually been participating in a number of regional broadband conferences in Virginia recently, and um, at the beginning, I always ask, uh, who's heard of Internet of Things? And i got to be honest, only a few hands go up, and most of them are IT folks. So I'm very grateful that DevStick is leading the, this awareness effort for public safety. Uh, so with that, let's... Uh, um, I think you've heard that I spent a large portion of my life as a firefighter and nearly an equal uh, amount of years pursuing technology to support public safety. What I'd like to share today is uh, what I've learned about the Internet of Things and the impact I believe it will have on firefighting. Okay, next slide. So this slide shows the wide reach of IoT. Some researchers uh, refer to smart cities but IoT will have a much wider reach. Uh, buildings, homes, factories, farms, utilities, vehicles, and people are all using sensors and controllers, including video, to increase safety and monitor productivity. Today, I'd like to offer some ways public safety will be able to tap into the Internet of Things to increase awareness and efficiency, as well as save more lives. Next slide. So many experts have designated the Internet of Things as the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, if we look back at the first three major industrial changes, you'll find that public safety has always lagged behind uh, each new trend. Uh, both the Model A and the Model T were being mass produced just after 1900, but it took another decade for the first motorized fire engines to come into production. That's because the total market is relatively small, and the features, like a large pump and the need to carry a lot of specialized equipment, made the design a one-off vehicle. Uh, if you could click the uh, next addition there. There we go. There's the old fire truck. Uh, the next thing you'll see there is the old fire alarm telegraph system. Uh, used to have pull boxes that were actually still being used into the 90s in several large cities. Next up was um, mobile data terminals, which I think most people recognize were actually a cast off from military, uh, modified for public safety use. Um, today, most fire departments still rely on paper maps and pre-fire plans in large loose leaf binders that they try to read while they're bouncing down the road responding to the next emergency. Next slide. There we go. Uh, so I included this just to emphasize that this is a real game changer. The predictions for connected devices, sensors, cameras, and a host of other elements is hard to imagine. But look back a decade ago, and who would have believed that we're now walking around with a smartphone 
and we can do more with that smartphone than you could do with a desktop computer from 10 years ago. So our challenge is how do we make sure public safety isn't left behind as these new capabilities are developed. So I realize this is an eye, eye test, <laughs> but the reason why I thought this was a very interesting graphic is um, it really shows the wide range of industries, applications, devices, and even locations where IoT is having an impact. Now, the good news is, uh, if you click the next uh, button there, uh, actually, that's a, uh, there we go. Um, so public safety is already on the map. So as we zoom in on that sector, you can see it's once again tilted towards the military, which, you know, God bless the military for what they do, and I'm glad that they get large budgets. But it really means that most of the research and development gets aimed at their needs, and public safety is, again, the poor stepchild. Now, certainly 9-11 and other high-profile catastrophes, uh, like just last weekend's tragedy in Las Vegas, creates an awareness of just how limited public safety technology is. Now, no one wants to take advantage of such terrible events, but part of learning from them is how we better serve public safety and protect them and ourselves in the future. So the next slide, um, this is uh, some good news here. Um, as public safety begins to adopt smartphones as a standard piece of equipment to be carried by fire, police, and EMS, they'll also be deploying a pretty nice set of sensors along with the phones. Uh, if you take a look at this diagram, you can see that, you know, proximity, uh, sound sensors, ambient light, the accelerometer, there's a lot of uh, cool uh, built-in features in today's smartphones. And, again, as um, FirstNet gets deployed and public safety starts to adopt uh, the use, they're going to deploy more of these smartphones to public safety folks. Now, few departments issue iPhones or other devices to firefighters today, um, but we think that's going to change as the mission-critical network gets deployed. Um, AT&T is already working on a public safety app store, and the FirstNet CTO is gathering information on what apps are in use today, and more importantly, what apps are needed to better serve and protect the community and first responders. Uh, the next slide is from... Uh, the recent September uh, FirstNet board meeting, and you can see that this slide from that presentation shows the areas where research is needed, as well as some equipment and software identified as having features that could one day provide more data at the scene of an emergency. Knowing the environment and type of operations that firefighters engage in, it's important that equipment be rugged and operate with little or no human interaction. No firefighter I know would put down the nozzle or their axe to play with an electronic gizmo in the heat of a fire. So these devices just can't just be user-friendly. They have to be user-respectful. And by that, I mean they have to respect the critical work that a firefighter is doing under very adverse conditions and provide the help uh, without drawing a user's attention from the important job at hand. So the next slide is uh, one that I found to be very important in defining the types of connected environments taking shape as this next industrial revolution starts to get traction. Uh, so some of you that follow me on Twitter um, and many more that follow Bill Schreier <laughs> may have uh, seen we had a bit of a uh, Twitter conversation um, a year and a half ago talking about um, the creation of an Internet of first responder things or an Internet of public safety things. So over the past year, Bill and FirstNet have settled on this breakdown of the world of Internet of Things. So if you look at the biggest circle at its wise, widest range, um, the Internet of Things will literally be worldwide. Um, then you break down to the green bubble when you talk about smart cities or the bigger grouping of smart communities. Uh, they will also have connected devices that focus on community needs. But under that heading, there will be devices that public safety could gain a great deal of data from in an emergency. So burglar alarms and fire alarms are obvious, but also CCTV systems and sensors in industrial buildings could also provide vital information to first responders. A much smaller grouping is public safety things 
This would be things like body-worn cameras, dash cams, hazmat devices, etc. And lastly, the Internet of Life-Saving Things. This encompasses public safety, specific items, uh, plus a wider group of Fitbits and uh, AEDs in public spaces, vehicle telematics, um, and building ventilation and CCTV systems. This is where we'd like to educate IoT developers of the needs of public safety and have them think of ways that each new sensor or node could also provide data to public safety in an emergency. In that way, we'll grow into uh, the Internet of life-saving things. So now I'd like to uh, introduce a real-life example of what IOLST could do to enhance fire operations. So this slide gives a summary of the data available at a high-rise building fire uh, today. So you get 911 data. Uh, hopefully you have that pre-fire plan, even if it's in a big loose-leaf binder, and that provides some basic building information. So the next slide, this is uh, the data that the incident commander doesn't have. And in most of the time, you're going to find this is a much bigger list. The incident commander won't have data on how many people are in the building, where they are in the building, and if any have special needs or are even immobile. Uh, they don't know what's burning or how much of the contents is involved, how many people have already evacuated. Uh, these are all unknowns. Add to this folks that like to say, uh, hey, there's a baby in there because they think that'll get the lazy firefighters to hustle more. Uh, believe me, I've been to more than one incident where folks have come up claiming that there's somebody in the building only to find it's been vacant for a number of years. Uh, so large fires like this are pretty chaotic, and the incident commander is making dozens of decisions with only a thimble full of data. On the next slide, uh, now this is uh, the fun part. So now we're going to dream a little bit about what the same event might look like with the Internet of Life-Saving Things capabilities. So first of all, through the building security system, the incident commander gets accurate data on how many residents are in the building and their room numbers. So think about how basic this capability is. Uh, today I can go to a convenience store to get gas, and while I'm at the pump, I pull out my phone and check email like most of us do, and boom, I get a push notification from the store. Come on in, Coke is on sale, pick up a six pack. So 7-Eleven has more capabilities than an incident commander at this point in time. So the incident commander arrives and doesn't get any information from the building. Um, so think about it. Why can't a push notification be activated in an emergency for first responders with the right security credentials on their handheld devices? As the building gets smarter, the fire department should have the ability to access building ventilation systems, sprinkler systems, as well as CCTV so that they can adjust them in ways to control the fire. And lastly, the uh, holy grail for the fire service is the ability to track and monitor every firefighter at the scene of an emergency. So the next slide, uh, this is what it would look like. Um, here we have the incident commander with a tablet that can show building plans, uh, access to material safety data sheets on all the chemicals in the building, uh, closed circuit TV from inside the building, uh, units actual locations as well as in building, uh, tracking each firefighter including their air supply usage, their heart rate and respiration, the ambient temperature in their location, and alerts when certain parameters are met. Uh, so here we see the fire truck zooming in, and then I think uh, here's the CCTV showing. And then we're going to get, uh, I think, a little motion here on some of the firefighters. Oh, actually, we're getting uh, uh, push notifications from residents or uh, relay notifications through the 911 system. Uh, then we have our tracking of firefighters. And lastly, uh, here's the information on a firefighter that's uh, – heart rate is reaching uh, dangerous levels. The next slide, um, we can't forget about drones. Uh, many of you may have seen recently that the, the fire department in New York City, the FDNY, has already begun using drones at several of their building fires. 
the drone provides a unique perspective. Um, it gives the ability to assess the exposure risk from surrounding buildings, as well as the progress of the fire attack from uh, uh, companies inside the building. So here's what I believe will be a secondary benefit of this Internet of life-saving things on the fire ground. It will basically be a decrease in verbal traffic. Think of it as more information becomes available as visible data, like the location of firefighters within a building. You won't need to call them and say, hey, what's your location? Now, I need to emphasize that I'm not predicting this is going to fully replace land mobile radio and voice communications. In an emergency, clear verbal communications will continue to be the best way to transmit the nature of the emergency. But data will certainly support many of the more routine activities that take place in an emergency, and that will free up radio traffic. This next slide is one that actually shows the firefighter and what type of, uh, uh, it's not the bionic firefighter, but it's certainly getting close when you add a set of sensors that uh, make the firefighter's job a lot more easier. Um, this way, it's not just um, a courageous human charging through the dark in a smoke-filled building. Uh, now you have enhanced vision, sensors that alert to temperature changes or body changes, voice-activated communications, and location tracking of all personnel in the building. Uh, if you get the chance, uh, this slide is up here. Uh, watch the YouTube video that I have a link to on here, um, and you're going to get a copy of this. So I realize you might not be able to read it on your computer screen, but it's a really cool conceptualization of a firefighter with these type of uh, enhanced capabilities. So now uh, the next topic I want to uh, address is uh, the PSAP. And everybody, I think, is aware that next generation 911 is going to provide the ability to text the 911. And with that text, we're also going to start receiving a lot of images and um, maybe even uh, video from the scene of an emergency. So I know when I worked in Baltimore City's 911 center, uh, how crazy it could get when you had a car fire on a major roadway and dozens of callers would dial 911 all to report the same fire. Uh, the call takers had to answer each call and try to clear the lines for another incident that might be uh, coming in behind that. So text messaging is going to take that to a whole other level. Uh, FirstNet is going to enable first responders in the field to receive text and video of incidents as they respond, but how will the poor call taker or dispatcher sort through 15 images and decide which best represents the emergency scene? Uh, so actually, I think our friends at Google may have shown us a solution for this. Uh, so we're going to wait here until uh, we go through this animation. Um, so what we're going to talk about now is algorithms. And I found this article on the web that describes an algorithm that Google came up with uh, to enhance groups of photos taken by users of their photo program. So the writer describes taking a series of photos of her friend and herself, and each one had a little deficiency. There was crazy eyes in one and no smile in another. But Google's algorithm could instantly scan the photos and apply a set of criteria developers had overlaid to analyze and correct minor deficiencies. The result was an altered photo where both people were looking their best. So let's apply this concept to an accident scene. So we have 20 spectators with all their new iPhones, and they're anxious to take photos of a fire at a gas station and try to get as many likes on their Facebook page. But as a secondary thought, they text their viral pic to the Peace Act. So imagine if experienced public safety personnel had worked and had worked with some smart developers, and they came up with an algorithm that knew what elements of a photo of a fire scene provide the best and right information. So when 20 text messages arrive, the algorithm sees they're all from the same geolocation. It instantly scans through the images and applies the criteria established by the public safety experts. This picture is too blurry. Uh, this one doesn't show the entire scene, and what happens is it actually picks out the one best view of that image, that scene, and then it sends it to the PSAP. It sends a file that has all the images in the file, but at the very top is the one that it's given the rating of the best overall view. 
So now the call taker, instead of having to sort 20 photos, looks at the one that is being recommended by the algorithm, says, yep, that looks like a pretty good photo, and hits send, and it's out. And this obviously would save time and effort on the part of the uh, call takers. Okay, so I know there's probably some folks on the call that are a little skeptical of this, uh, but I really believe it's worth exploring to help our already busy PSAT personnel manage the volume of data coming their way. And certainly if there are any lawyers on the call, uh, I acknowledge that the technology has to be tested and certified for use in critical situations. Um, so here's an example uh, that I found online. And apparently this algorithm can't differentiate between a small dog and a muffin. Now, obviously this one isn't ready for prime time. <laughs> okay, so now um, to wrap up, Here's a uh, very busy chart, uh, but it shows the landscape of companies currently engaged in IoT. Um, I have two little arrows on there, little yellow arrows, that point to AT&T and Motorola as two public safety-focused companies who are also FirstNet partners. Um, I'm not going to cover much more on this, but we'll you have it for reference. And again, you'll get the slide after the call. I also like the breakdown of categories that they used in, uh, in this chart. So, uh, again, I want to thank NIFSIC for their leadership in identifying IoT as a new development that public safety needs to monitor and hopefully steer towards solutions to enhance the difficult jobs that first responders do with very little technology today. I know DHS, S&T, NIST, APCO, and FirstNet are all interested in helping to identify ways this next industrial revolution can serve our nation's fire, police, and EMS. And I think you, uh, on this call, are, uh, can also be a contributor to this. Uh, it's an exciting time for public safety and a great time to dream of what could be. So the last slide is just uh, my contact, or actually my uh, Twitter handle. So uh, if you get a chance, uh, certainly take a look at my Twitter feed, follow me on Twitter, You'll find that all my tweets are positive and focused on making the world a better place for public safety. Uh, that concludes my presentation, uh, Barry. So um, I'll pass it back to you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Chief Lear. That was a, a great presentation. And it actually, uh, I think, is a, is a good place for us to begin talking sort of the next phase of this working group, which is, you know, kind of what we want to do with all of this, uh, with, with everything we're hearing up to now about, you know, the background of Internet of Things. And one thing that I took out of your your presentation was that there there may be two things that, that kind of need to happen here. One is you mentioned getting the, the IoT vendors, the people who, who build these products, to, to be responsive to public safety's needs. And then the second thing, I think, is just getting the first responders to kind of pay attention to the benefits and the possibilities of Internet of Things data. And I'm wondering if you could maybe take each of those and give a few thoughts about, you know, specifically what you think needs to happen with, with vendors and also with, with the public safety community to get us from thinking about these kind of wonderful things to actually starting to uh, use them. Okay. I'd be happy to, to take a swing at those two, uh, Barry. Uh, so the first one in terms of how we get the, um, the development community to be aware of public safety's needs, uh, I think the hackathons, uh, I've mentioned I participated in two of those with AT&T and APCO. Uh, one was in Washington, one was in Atlanta, and they were focused on developing first responder solutions. And it was really cool to sit in a room with a lot of bright, smart mostly college students who are into developing apps, and they can literally sit in a room and over a span of 24 hours come up with a, a pretty meaningful application that can solve a specific issue that you present to them. Hmm. So I think, I think that that's certainly one avenue to use, and there's a number of uh, folks doing that besides AT&T. Uh, I know there's a... Uh, innovation group in Northern Virginia that has also uh, set one up specifically for public safety, I think, later this month. Um, so that would be one way, I think. And I think that FirstNet and AT&T obviously have already uh, been made aware of that. But 
I think uh, either NIPSTIC or uh, DHS, s and In fact, I think s and is also doing something uh, similar to that with trying to attract developers for public safety solutions. Uh, and then on the uh, education of um, the public safety community, um, again, uh, APCO has done a really good job with this. Uh, NIPSTIC and, and this committee uh, has probably a, a broader and different reach uh, so in continuing these types of dialogues and showing up at conferences and taking a booth at a conference and talking about the need for uh, IoT for uh, public safety. I think that's a good way to get uh, the education started. Uh, if you think back uh, five or six years, not too many public safety folks knew about broadband, but now here we are on the uh, uh, horizon of it actually being deployed across the country. And I think one of the specific goals of this group is to, ve to develop some materials that will help educate first responders about the, spe the specific benefits and, and also what, what they need to know about uh, IoT uh, to be able to use it more effectively. Let me open it up to the rest of the group. Does anyone have uh, questions for Chief Lear? Um, I have a question. Um, this is Gina Harrison from um, from Commerce Department. I um, I wonder, what, given all that, uh, where, what transmission um, modes do you expect IoT coming from, say, the smart building that you're, you portray there? All those um, all that sensor data. What do you expect, what network do you expect that to travel on, or how do you expect it to travel, and where do you expect it to be analyzed? At what point? Uh, very good question. So the uh, network to convey this type of data is going to be actually every network that's out there today. So uh, a number of the carriers, uh, Verizon, AT&T, T-Mobile, all provide this type of uh Internet connectivity, not just for people in their smartphones and their computers, but also for these Internet devices, uh, uh, the, the box that sits on your kitchen table and, you know, you can ask it questions uh, in the kitchen for, you know, what's the best recipe for this or that. Uh, those are all connected through the Internet, and so it's, it's through a carrier. Um, also, the example I use for the building of getting a push notification um, the 7-Elevens of the world actually use their Wi-Fi to do that. So first responders being in the proximity of the building could possibly get those messages through Wi-Fi and not have to even connect to a commercial network. Um, uh, let me see. There was, I believe, a um, second part of the processing. How is this going to be processed? That was um, uh, the interesting thing that I tried to address somewhat with the, uh, with the PSAP discussion. So. The idea is that people will be, just like they dial 911 in an emergency today, they'll be sending text messages and video of an accident scene or a fire scene to the 911 center through text to 911. Uh, what I'm hoping is that algorithms can be developed so that it's not an actual person that has to sift through uh, 10 or 15 or 20 or more uh, text messages to figure out you know, which image do I want to then forward uh, through the dispatch network to the first responders? Did that um, Chuck, answer your I, question? Yes, it did. Um, I guess I'm wondering, do you expect any other, like, data processing points to, for, I don't know if that's the correct term, like, for example, closer to the building? Like, we heard, I don't know if it was this group, but NIPSTIC did a presentation by Dr. Chow from NASA, had a presentation on uh, his virtual assistant, you know, uh, Audrey. Have you seen that, um, Dr. Chief Lair? Um, that, and I'm, I, I just, I still don't understand exactly how the telecom of that works. Uh, uh, but it, that assistant would sort of process, I think, closer to the venue than, uh, um, than a PSAP. But I don't want to get out, you know, beyond my knowledge. And I'm, real, I'm asking you. <laughs> I'm going to show Ray, you. Ray, very loose. Uh, she was speaking. There, there was a discussion on edge processing and, and how much of the analytics may be done uh, on the firefighter's device versus some nearby devices versus having to depend on the cloud to, to push stuff back. Okay. Well, thanks for bailing me out, Barry, because she's putting me up against a rocket scientist. So this, this is Tony Martwick. So this, this is Tony Martwick. I was going to make, make a comment that is that um, great great presentation, Chief. And uh, one of the things I, I've been thinking about this uh, and talking and having numerous discussions about you know 
IoT and public safety. And I, I think one of the things that this working group will need to kind of establish out of the gate too, uh, as as we educate folks, is um, ensuring a, a standard standardization of APIs, open APIs, because um, that that's one of the the Achilles heels to putting the patchwork of all these edge connected devices generating data sets going into various platforms, whether it's a CAD or dispatch or uh, out to an application is ensuring that as we message this to the community that um, we foster the, the environment of open standards because without that, uh, the, the integration is going to be very challenging. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, and I think that's an excellent point. And again, probably a focus area for NISTIC, uh, because I know being in public safety for so many years that, uh, trying to do interoperability with LAM mobile radio after the fact, and then trying to do interoperability with CAD, again, when vendors have already, you know, manufactured CAD systems with their secret sauce, uh, nobody wanted to share APIs. So I think this is absolutely the right time where IoT is just developing uh, to make sure that the standards are as wide open as possible. So this is terrific, uh, Nokia. Can you can you please go back to the the slide where you said uh, where it says what what the incident commander doesn't have in terms of data with a, with the with the building on fire? Yes. So basically what the no, incident no, commander gets. No, no I understand. Uh, I was just about to ask you uh, one or two questions on this uh, or maybe make a comment on this. Uh, uh, so a lot, you know, the building belongs to somebody. Yes. Um, who, whose responsibility would it be to install all sorts of sensors in the building? I understand you could do this maybe with a new smart uh, intelligent buildings, but how would you go about it? Uh, and I understand it's a concept, it's a goal, it's an objective. Uh, you know, ideally, you'd like the incident commander to have access to all sorts of information, but that information come, may come from different players. And where the aggregation is, where the processing is, where the collection takes place, um, is very much function as who owns who owns the actual data. Would you agree or? I absolutely agree, and I think that um, what I found in Baltimore City, which has a wide variety of high-rise buildings, if you were in a high-rise uh, for low-income families, there was less likelihood that you had access to very uh, detailed information or verifiable information. But if you went to one of the high-end condominiums, um, there was always a building security system, and somebody has the data with you know, who's in the building and who's not in the building. And those are the types of buildings that I think get more attention from, you know, the developers and uh, those types of additional sensors and cameras and so forth exist. But, again, you're absolutely right. This is a hope. Uh, it's not something that's available today uh, in most urban areas. So uh, going in from Moro, uh, to continue that point, and I think this is one of the most important points, I think the integration to existing systems, right, there's SCADA systems, building management system already exists in some of those buildings. But the integration and carrying the data all the way back to, to the fire or police uh, would be the challenge. How do you see regulation playing a role in this space, if, if at all? So certainly the uh, fire codes, uh, for local jurisdictions, and again, there's a national model for fire codes, um, which the National Fire Protection Association puts together, and a lot of cities and uh, uh, counties and even states adopt those standards, um, but a lot more are developed locally, uh, but, but certainly with, um, uh, for example, uh, in-building repeater systems, there's a number of jurisdictions that have built into their fire code uh, any new construction has to also put in an in-building antenna system so that firefighters entering the building have radio communications. <clears throat> so that's certainly one element. Uh, building codes can be changed so that these types of uh, sensor networks uh, have an emergency push that goes to the incident commanders, the public safety folks responding. 
Uh, Chief, this is Mark Schroeder in uh, Phoenix. Um, the, the, you went right into the area that I was going to ask you about with with regard to this, and, and it, it's just more of an observation from experience and so on. Um, one of the challenges, <clears throat> and this is what I was going to bring up, one of the challenges with, with smart building uh, information and systems and so on, um, while building codes are uh, generally static, nice static things to put up and may work out very well for an initial inspection, um, one of the challenges that folks have always had, um, and, and this isn't intended to throw water on anything, has been the ability to go back and repeatedly verify that the, the systems um, are, are still state in operation, reporting proper information, so on and so forth. Um, so, the ch and, and this is this was seen through the in-building repeater systems, in that people would generally install them, and then that's the last anybody ever saw of maintenance uh, or reliability out of these systems, unless there was a very aggressive code enforcement to review on that type of thing. So, it, just as a note, it, it's uh, obviously they're finding a carrot approach to encouraging the smart building. Uh, approach uh, would be one of those things to, to try to look at in parallel to doing this because this, this certainly is one of those workable things from a technical standpoint, but it always seems to come down to how do these things stay in operation and stay, stay maintained, and usually it just happens one and one time only as opposed to it being an ongoing thing. Yeah, good point, Mark. Um, and I, I go back to my story about the 7-Eleven. You know, the reason why 7-Eleven will give you a push notification is because they're drawing in people to buy Coke. And so there's a business model that, that uh, keeps that supported. So they'll pay their monthly bill to keep the, uh, uh, the network in place. Uh, perhaps uh, some other folks can come up with a way that smart buildings can generate revenue or at least reduce costs uh, if they're sending out maintenance advisories to their uh, maintenance guy that, you know, this particular fluorescent light ballast is about to blow up, so you've got to get up there and change it. If they see a cost savings with these types of networks, then hopefully public safety can come in as, oh, since you have the network already, how about if you give us access to it in an emergency? Hey, Chief. This is uh, Rick Lust from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Thank you very much. Um, I, I wanted to help cover a couple things. Um, you kind of got into the smart buildings and how you're going to do code enforcement and, and incentivize people to do it, and it gets outdated. I'd prefer to say the easiest thing is an insurance thing. So 7-Eleven would be more than happy. Most businesses would be more than happy if it would reduce some costs and make them exemplars in the IoT. I, I, I am an IoT guy and a drone guy. Um, so my first thought on all this was about situational awareness at the incident. So if you can bring in, and this might answer a couple of questions where we're at the edge of computing or whatever. If you can bring to the fight with your bunker gear uh, a mini cloud with some masks, your RFIDs, and honestly, we've already developed these things for different government entities for over 10 years where I work. So all this stuff is out there. It's just not been integrated for first responders. So I've been talking to Teeks, and I have a meeting with them next week to try to integrate these technologies because it really is engineering 101. It's not invention. So a lot of these things have been out in the field for a long time. It's just not been uh, utilized that way. Uh, I Three years ago, I designed the sensor array for the Iron Man suit for SOCOM. Everything that they were, that I put in that thing is off the shelf. So there's a lot of this stuff that's available. It's just domain stacks. I mean, you probably and the, and the people that you work with know everything about a hazmat fire with a certain kind of chemical. I don't. On the other hand, a lot of these other things, if, uh, you mentioned hackathons. If we could have an opportunity to sit in the room with some people, um, there's a lot of things that we've done for a number of years that could answer these things. And I just like to get that opportunity to do that. Well, thank you, Rich. And I, I think that goes back to Barry's point that, you know, we are a very small community, uh, the public safety community. And as this 
Internet of Things grows uh, at much wider scale, worldwide scale. There are certainly uh, places like the National Labs where you guys have solved uh, tremendous problems, and we're just not aware of it, and you're not aware of our needs. So, so doing that, you know, speed dating to get together and exchange ideas, I think, is a great next step. Well, let's do that immediately. <laughs> It's on the list. We'll... So, um, Ray, let me let me just have, make a couple of of, of kind, kind of final thoughts here. Uh, first, I, I want I don't know if Gina Harris is still on the call, but I just wanted to follow up on that the whole Audrey presentation. Man, that keeps me awake at night. I cannot figure out how how public safety is going to deal with something like that, Audrey. Chief is is really what I would call a personal assistant on steroids, which is you know it's, it's kind of a Siri type of thing that would would provide interactive response with first responders, but also it has the the analytics involved to to basically take a large amount of data and analyze it and and provide a, a, sort of similar to your push notifications, but 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 the data that's that's needed for the first responder based on the incident and what's available. Uh, which could be a huge benefit, but man, I, I just don't know how it's gonna, how, how we're gonna deal with it. Uh, the, the second thing is I want to thank you because what I want to start doing now with this group is start focusing on some specific use cases, and you've you've given us a, a fantastic one with this high-rise building fire, which I I, I want to steal from you if that's okay. <laughs> and, and take some of that information uh, and, and put it into to our development of use cases because I, I think this is a great one and it points up a lot of not only the benefits but also the challenges that, that we're going to have um, as we adopt this new new technology. Um, so uh, again, I just want to thank you, Chief. A great great presentation and. Uh, and maybe we'll try to have you back here again sometime in the future for, for some follow-up. Well, thank you, Barry, and, and you're absolutely welcome to the slides as well as anybody on the call. I think Dawn has uh, said she's going to push them out. So, uh, um, and, and again, I gave you uh, my Twitter handle. My email contact is uh, Chief Lear, C-H-I-E-F-L-E-H-R, at yahoo.com. Uh, so if anybody has any follow-up questions that you didn't bring up on the uh, call, uh, I'd be happy to hear from you uh, by email. Appreciate it, Chief.